James Andrew Miller has a brand new book. It is called Tinderbox, HBO's Ruthless Pursuit of New Frontiers. It's another, I say another because he's really carved out a niche for himself. It's an oral history, much as he has done for SNL, for ESPN, and for CAA, Creative Artists Agency. Jim, it's so great to have you back on the program. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me back, Michael. So this really is uh, like a franchise that you've got going, right? This idea of I am going to pursue an oral history of some big entity or some major project. Did it begin fortuitously? I mean, tell me how you, you latched on to this. Well, I'm not so sure there was a strategic plan in place, but I do think that there's something that's been incredibly exciting about taking deep dives into these powerful brands. And it turns out all four of them started in the 1970s. And all four of them were incredibly uh, humble in their origins, and there were very few expectations. In, in fact, in each of these cases, I mean, 10 minutes before the first show of SNL, Chevy Chase is asking someone, what do you think I should do next? Because everybody thought that was going to fail. People at ESPN were running on Tuesdays to the bank to cash their checks because they didn't think there was going to be enough money, you know, to, <laughs> to, to, to literally keep this thing going. CA was a bunch of bridge tables. And in the case of HBO, one of the things that Jerry Levin and others who were there at the very beginning, Chuck Dolan, who's now 93, um, told me was that this was a precarious, precarious infancy. In fact, Time Inc., HBO's partner almost put the hit the delete key on it several times. So I like the idea that, you know, there's this kind of shoots and ladders aspect to it. Well, it's interesting that you reference that because one of my favorite uh, anecdotes in the book, and there's a laundry list that I've assembled, I won't be able to get to a fraction of them. Correct me if I'm wrong, the Poseidon adventure saved HBO at an early stage. Absolutely. Well, you know, early on in HBO's history, part of its value proposition to viewers was, listen, we can do something that nobody else can do. We're going to show you movies and we're going to they're not going to be cut. They're not going to be censored by network censors. And also there won't be commercials. And so that's part of what that and actually boxing were the two big engines that got them started early on. And the Poseidon Adventure turned out to be this huge hit. There was also something, they were giving away free turkeys at the beginning if you subscribe to HBO. And it turns out like that the free turkeys and the Poseidon Adventure were big, big, important elements of their success early on. Jim, I, uh, my folks are from the coal regions of Pennsylvania. They're from the Hazleton area. But I have a distinct recollection in the 1970s and, and, and you give the whole history in the book of how HBO was started, including the rollout for, what was it, like 300 people in Wilkes-Barre in 1972? Yeah, and I have, a distinct, I have a distinct recollection of my Uncle Jim in Hazleton uh, having, you know, quote unquote, home box, except I think that his was a knockoff because once it was launched in Wilkes-Barre, everybody up there wanted to have it, some who were paying and some who were not. Right. Well, there was always that little, <laughs> some people were able to finesse getting HBO without right. actually paying for it. And that was something that HBO had to struggle with and figure out how to, how to combat, uh, you know, pretty early on in its existence. But it was amazing that the word of mouth, I mean, first of all, it gave you cable, gave you better reception. So there were a lot of rural areas and particularly even in like New York City, where it first started, uh, when they first started wiring it, where you you know, you couldn't get exposure. And so cable really gave you better reception. George Carlin's seven words were uttered on HBO, right? Well, see, this is part of what HBO does early on, Michael. And it's so smart because they make a decision that we're not going to try and mimic what the networks are doing. In fact, we're going to do the opposite. So what can we do? Well, because we don't have network sensors, we're going to say things that you can't say on TV. We're going to show things that you can't show on TV. We're going to show violence. And George Carlin takes it to the limit. He literally does the sketch, seven words you can't say on television. On television. What could be better for HBO than having everybody know that this is now the wild, wild west? I have so many memories of the, the, the boxing uh, events on HBO. And one of the 
one of the anecdotes that I enjoyed is Larry Merchant. Actually, Jim, we should tell people the way you approach your craft. This is one giant conversation with all of the business execs, all of the people who played a critical role in the founding, all of the A-list celebrities. It's, it's as if you've got them in this giant conference room and each is taking a turn speaking and reassembling the story of HBO. I mean, that's the approach. How you go about this and keep it all straight, I have no idea. Say a word about your process and then I'll, I'll tell you the story I wanted to raise. Well, it's a disturbing process. No, I'm just kidding. I do have a little bit of an OCD because I like hearing from key individuals. I like listening to people much like yourself. I mean, you you know, the, the, my job is to create a narrative structure around it all, Michael. I have, you know, I there is the corporate tale. There's the corp, there's the tale of the development of HBO movies, of HBO series, of the documentary unit, HBO sports, and of course, the big saga of HBO itself, having the parent company that gets taken merged then taken over by AOL, then Time Warner, then AT&T comes in. So I have to get all those disparate elements somehow together in one narrative. And I think that, you know, what I try and do is I try and make sure that, you know, the, the key moments, those key inflection points or the best stories are there. And it was great to talk to Larry Merchant as you were just referring to. I mean, boxing was yeah. huge early on. Well, I, I'll never forget. I will never forget when James Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. And one of the anecdotes in the book is Larry Merchant telling you what it was like to be in the ring to interview James Buster Douglas and 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 Buster Douglas having to need to just step away. He had lost his mother recently. I'm sure many will remember that. And, and Larry just allowed him to collect himself. But that's the richness of what you do. You know, people who love The Sopranos, they're going to love hearing about David Chase going out to the Beverly Hills Hotel to sit down with Italian-American leaders who have a beef who haven't even seen it yet. Or, yeah, that you know, Jeff, well. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Bucus. Here's another one that I loved. I could rattle off 20 of these for you just sitting here. But Jeff Bucus, you know, in a conversation about whether – uh, the Larry Sanders show. Oh, my God. Did I love the Larry Sanders show? Is it too Jewish? Right. You know, are they going to watch? Are they going to watch it in the Midwest? By the way, that's a conversation you could have had about Curb or even about Seinfeld, even though Seinfeld is not an HBO property. Well, I think that, you know, all these things that come up, we realize over the 49 year history of HBO, there were some really big, not only television landmarks, but they became cultural landmarks. I mean, I think that it's fair to say that The Sopranos transcended just normal television show. It had a huge impact on how storytelling was conducted, you know, and how, and the impact that it had on the culture and cultural references that emanated from it. So I, I think it's it's kind of like amazing to, to, to get access to these people and to sit there and listen to the impact. And by the way, the thing about HBO, Michael, is that people didn't just date this place. They married it. They were there for like 15, 20, 25, 30 years. They had, I had more than a dozen people cry during interviews because it was so impactful for them when they left or that first time that they, the first time that Sex in the City was on the air and nobody believed in it. And then all of a sudden it became this gigantic hit, you know, and I mean, the stories from Game of Thrones, they're shooting on four in four different countries. They're spending more money than they ever have on any other series. What's that like? And what, what happens when all of a sudden there's an incredible, blizzard and it, it it just decimates the entire set the entire town they have hundreds of extras there i mean you know it, it kind of goes on and on and on and what i try and do is show you know we know what we saw on sunday nights right but we don't know what happened beforehand and what was going on behind the scenes and so that's really the kind of like purpose of these books is to is to not only develop a history of a book of record about the history of this place but also to share i mean julia louis dreyfus was incredible larry david was amazing you know the stories people told about jim gandolfini uh, you know i could listen to that all day and that's that's not me talking. Oh, me too. Uh, Jim, Jim, I am. I, I, this would be like choosing among my children if, if I were to have to pick my favorite. But I am I am like a, a curb, uh, real devotee. Love Larry David. Love everything about curb. You interview Ted Danson. And, and, and I should point out one of the things that you discuss in the book is it was never intended to be a series. It was going to be a special. Right. And and then you talk about like some of the magic and the genius of curb. And Ted Danson says, 
Curb comes along as a lark, like doing summer theater or even less important than that. And I found that my sense of fun and my delight in acting got rejuvenated. I, I just loved hearing all the behind the scenes from the people who made it happen. Anything in particular that that strikes you about Curb and what you learned? Well, you know, Susie Essman, who is just a, I mean, a gift from above. You the know, bomb. She says, she says to me, she gets stopped in supermarkets for, uh, you know, for pe people, women come up to her and say, can I FaceTime my husband? Because I'd love for you to call him a fat fuck. Excuse my language. Um, <laughs> she says, Jim, that's what my life has become. I mean, you know, and when, when Larry showed the pilot, so to speak, for uh, Curb to Ted and his wife, Mary Steenburgen. And it was a bunch of people up in Martha's Vineyard. They're all looking like, hey, Larry, okay, well. Right, on, falling asleep. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we want to be supportive. And here it is. It's more than 20 years later. And again, we come back to, you know, what does HBO do? It says to Larry David, we're going to be the opposite of a network. We're never going to give you notes. And you can come and go as you please. Michael, the guy disappeared for seven years, then all of a sudden one day, you know, <laughs> like, I think I think I want to come back and I want to do some more seasons. You never know, by the way, they never know if it's going to be his last season. They never know if he's going to come back. They can go. I mean, you can't do that in network. And so that kind of flexibility is, you know, really, really amazing. I mean, Larry Sanders, I mean, Gary Shanley once turned in a show that was only 20 minutes long because he thought the rest of it sucked. And so right. he just he turned it on. Then he disappeared for a year there. I mean, I think that one of the things that HBO does really well is it creates this world of freedom where actors and creators can come and do things that they can't do anyplace else. Hey, I have to say just a, a little hometown homage that uh, on page 9 hundred and seventy one. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a book that's like a thousand pages long. Sure, but I love I love I loved Kate Winslet's conversation with you about trying to get right the Delco, Pennsylvania inflection of one's voice or or accent. Final question for for Jim. And the book is tremendous. And I could I, I just really enjoyed it because I can pick it up and put it down and come back to it and obviously don't have to, to do it in in just a couple of sittings. Um, I guess it de it's determined by the measuring stick. But what would these HBO folks say was the greatest property, the biggest success? Is it Game of Thrones? Is it Sopranos? Is it Curb? What is it? I, you know, I, I ask those people qu those questions and they look at me like, you know, I'm on crack because for them, right. it's so hard to, to choose. It's like choosing amongst your children. I think that part of it is that if you, chances are, if I'm sitting there with somebody from H at HBO and they've worked there for a couple of years, so they're only in their late twenties or in their early thirties, they're going to say Game of Thrones, or they might even right. say Succession, because Succession has become this unbelievable yeah. force. Yes, agreed. Way, one, one second about Succession, Michael, what network would put on a show where there is no character that you like? There is nobody. In That's that not true. Hanging. That is not true. Okay, that is, is not it? true. Come on, bring it on. Uh, Maca Maca Macaulay Culkin's brother, Roman. Yeah. Here, here, okay, he's yeah. my guy. He's wow. my guy. OK, I think yeah. we have to go to Vienna. We have to go to Vienna and sit down, lie you down on a couch and figure out why that's the case. But my only point <laughs> is they're, they're not heroic, right? They're not aspirational characters. And the other thing they did with Succession was they said, we don't need a big star. We don't need to like have Jenna, Jennifer Aniston playing Shiv or something. Let's just these are all talented actors. Let's just go for it. So anyway, sorry for that digression. But I think, look, Sopranos is on the Mount Rushmore of of television. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I, I think that, you know, there are people that still think about uh, Oz or Six Feet Under and all these other, this, The Wire is arguably, you know, one of the sure. top shows ever made on television. So you have this incredible, incredible inventory to choose from. Congratulations. It's called Tinderbox. I really appreciate your being back and I hope I see you soon. Hey, thanks for having me.